Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. Our home here in the islands is just right next door to St. Augustine's Catholic Church. So if you see St. Augustine's and you're here, you know, Bear and Cindy are nearby. So we always love it. If you're coming to the islands, why not go to our website, deepadventure.com, and fill out the contact form. Just say, hey, you guys want you want a cup of coffee? Or maybe you want to learn how to surf. Uh, we, we, we just never know who the tide's going to bring in. So we'd love to, uh, to see if you come to the islands. We have as our guest today, Joe McLean. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, Cindy and I have a, a sailboat in, we, we sail in the Caribbean area, uh, and the name of the sailboat is the Spirit of Adventure. And the scripture verse that we live by with that sailboat is that those that are like the, those who are led by the Spirit are like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from, you don't know where it's going. These are the words of Jesus. Uh, and that's the way it's like when you're sailing, uh, you might say, I wanna go from here to that island tomorrow. But you wake up and there's a th- there's a storm coming, or the wind is the trade winds are no longer blowing and there, there's no wind at all, or it's coming from the wrong direction and you're going to have to beat up wind to, to be able to get to your destination. We want to be those kind of people where you when you wake up in the morning you say the Holy Spirit where are you leading me today? Um, it's really it's really a beautiful thing when you just let go. You know the most beautiful thing about a sailboat is when you when you turn off the engine. Sometimes you need it to get out of a harbor or something, but then you turn off the engine and the wind is taking you to wherever you're going. That's the way Christ wants us to be. Uh, that you don't know, you know, what if you're walking down the street today and you see a beautiful person, but they have a limp and uh, you have a chance to you have a chance to make eye contact with them and just say, just tell them to have a good day or just to show love to them. Or being in line, uh, getting in, getting in line, and there's someone there who you know, uh, a, a, a woman who looks tired and distressed. She's got a, a kid in her in her in her in the stroller and a child in her arms. How nice would it be for you to say, "Why don't you go in line first? You know, so it's a, it's a little things that that differentiate a Christian from someone who isn't a Christian, and that is because we hear the Spirit of God, we feel the love of God, and we move on. The, we move when the Holy Spirit says move. How Wouldn't that be nice if you were that type of person who when you woke up in the morning, you said, Thy will be done to the Lord, and then you just let God guide you through your day. What what uh, what shirt should I wear today? Wouldn't that be nice just to ask God that? Um, what, what word, what word uh, who should I be praying for? Um, how do I make a stand in my workplace? You know, what work can I do for the Lord? Well, one of the people that's like that in my mind is is our guest today, Joe McLean. I've I've known Joe for many years, and I've been able to see him be propelled by the Holy Spirit in so many ways. It's not like it's fractured energy, but there's just this willingness to say yes to the Lord, and the Lord has sent him on so many adventures. He's a he's a filmmaker. He's a rodeo ho- a rodeo host a radio host. <laughs> uh, uh, a Catholic take. Uh, he's an author and uh, and and frequent public speaker, and he speaks a lot. Uh, two men uh, about uh, in at men's conferences. So, uh, Joe McLean, it's good to have you on the show. Bear, thanks for having me on. Praise be to God. And I wish, I wish I was in a rodeo. That sounds like fun, actually. I'd you know, love to someday try to ride a bull. Someday. Well, yeah. Well, you know, my 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 wife is a is a rodeo girl. Wow. You yeah, she, barrels. Yeah, she wrote barrel racing and trick riding. Oof. That in takes fact, some skill. In fact, just just to do a little promo here, you know, she's the one that gave me the inspiration for my new book, Twelve Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? You know, it's a thing. That's right. That's so, right. Uh, so yes, and so, but but that's very much like you. I've really, I, you know, one of the things about having a radio show is you have conversations with people that sometimes you would never have if you were just sitting and having coffee or bumping into them. You really, you really develop friendships just in the times that we've had together, and I think we've had. Probably four dialogues together so far, maybe five, maybe more. I'm not sure, but it's just always good to be with you. And I was going to—I was telling you earlier, people, if you're not seeing the YouTube version of this, if you're listening to it on the radio, Joe McLean is starting to look like a Greek early church <laughs> father. He's got, and in his in his office, he's got icons in the background, and uh, I don't know, he's going the way he's he, one of these days. He's going to start talking Greek instead of English. Yeah. Hopefully, someday. <laughs> I got to tell you, you just reminded me. 
of something about your book that I really just, we talked about it on my radio show when I had you on recently. Um, one of the things you say in this book that really just stuck with me, and I was talking to my kids about this over lunch uh, Sunday after mass, you know, superficial conversations that men tend to have, um, that is a, that's a red flag to me. There's, there's a, I, I have very, very few friends, actual friends in life, because most of the time conversations tend to just be very superficial. And there's just on rare occasion when you meet a guy where you can have more a, a lengthy, protracted, deeper kind of conversation, conversations of substance. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you find that, you, you really resonate with that person and you mm -hmm. look forward to talking to them again. Even if the conversations can be spicy at times, you still appreciate that. And it's those superficial conversations that you just got like, you know, I just don't need that in my life, you know? So I really resonated with that in your book and I found it very fascinating. And you're right, in the radio world, in the radio business, we get to have conversations with all kinds of people about all kinds of topics. And it's very fascinating to be able to, to talk about things that you don't, I honestly love as part of my job daily, Monday through Friday, is to having conversations that you're not really allowed to have, okay? There's like these unwritten rules in Catholic media. You're not allowed to touch that third rail. And we're, we're dancing on that third rail all the time because people are asking tough questions these days. People, mm. especially the lay folks, are feeling very confused, very bewildered, very tired of the headlines, very very worn out by the scandals that keep coming up in the church. And, and they want clarity and they're not finding it all that often. So. I feel like it's a great opportunity in radio to dialogue, to have conversations, to especially the ones that people are thinking internally, but not allowed to say really out loud in, in you know, in company around their parishioners, their fellow parishioners mm -hmm. or what have you. So I love that about our job. And again, just to go back to your book, I really felt like this is so true. When you, when you, when you come across a friend and uh, you're able to connect at a deeper level, it sticks fast. And you really, really do appreciate that level of camaraderie. Yeah, there's so, there's so often, um, you know, I go golfing with my son, Jeremiah. We have a great time together. But every now and then they say, oh, there's, there's a twosome. We're going to join you up with another twosome, you know, and, or, or, <laughs> or another one's going to join you. And it's very interesting to see who that person is. You know, uh, sometimes it's just all about business. Sometimes it's all about sports. Sometimes it's just de denigrating women. Uh, or, or, or using Christ's name in vain, and, and in all those situations, it's an opportunity to uh, to be to respond in a way that challenges them to be better men, and then and then to have a deeper conversation. In Hawaii, you know, it's very rare, it's very jarring when someone asks you, "Well, what do you do?" It's kind of like not the most important thing that we talk about here. We may talk about surfing or or a lot about family, uncles and aunties here. But uh, not the superficial things. Father Bryce Lundgren, you got to have him on your show, wrote a book called The Catholic Cowboy Way. I inspired mm. him to write that book, and I put him together with Sophia, and he got his book out first. And he was saying, <laughs> and he writes about it in his book. I couldn't write, read his book till I finished mine because I knew I didn't want to plagiarize him. I'd probably just, like, say ditto. <laughs> but he talks about if he's out riding on the range with, with his buddy Zeke in Wyoming, and he says, hey, Zeke, we need to be more vulnerable and transparent with each other. He had head for the hills. Yeah. But if you said, you know, we need to be more gritty with each other. We need to get real with each other. Men need that type of conversation, right? Time, time, you know, have a cigar and a shot of whiskey. That's a good 45-minute conversation. And go deeper with your son or go deeper with, you know, with uh, your brothers or the men in your life. Develop brotherhood. Yeah, it's critical. Uh, it's been a big part of my work in Catholic ministry for the past 20 years. It's been men's apostolate work. I was very blessed back in 2007 to get connected to Mark Houck with the Kingsmen. Love Mark. And yeah. uh, as a result, I've been to tons of the retreats that he holds every year, the End of the Wild retreats and the Samson retreats, and able to give talks at those retreats and help uh, serve on team. And then, you know, speaking at men's conferences. And I've always found, you know, sort of your, your point a minute ago, I've always found that when I give talks, in fact, I just gave a talk to a group of teens and I kind of do the same thing for the teens, for the women, but it's generally the same. And that is straight talk. I think it really cuts through the, when you, when you don't lead with fluff and you give them straight talk, I think people pay attention to that. I also love to tell the stories of sinners and saints, so I leverage the stories uh, in order to illustrate a point, but I, I cut through the fat and give them straight talk. And especially with men, when they hear the boldness and the courage to 
to admit, you know, like in my own case, well, when I was living in Hawaii, back when I was in the Marine Corps and I committed the mortal sin of abortion there in Honolulu, you know, I, when I talk about that very forthrightly or pornography addiction or cohabitation and, and, and all of the hedonist activities that I celebrated when I, uh, when I was young, they can finally, for the first time in their, uh, you know, for many years probably, admit their own issues because someone else was able to admit them publicly. It frees them up. They feel actually free exactly right. to, to say the in the quiet part out loud. And I, I especially love doing those at men's conferences or retreats when a priest is available because then they can hear confessions. And it's like you get them, you, you, you strike when the iron's hot. And mm. these men, they, they come all out of that confessional like floating off the ground. They're on cloud nine. I, I, so, that's, what I, that, that's what I say. Uh, confession is like it's like floating off the ground you know i i you know like it's like it's, it's like going skydiving you know you um you're always scared and nervous before you go to jump out of a plane and uh you're very you know you're very contemplative about you know <laughs> your life and life decisions <laughs> and then and then and and then you jump out of that plane and no matter how scared people are once they jump out of the plane complete joy covers their face I've, mm -hmm. I, on, on some occasions, but almost always, com complete joy when that canopy opens, when the Lord forgives you in the in, in the confessional, <laughs> and you and you come outside and you say your prayers. You uh, you feel after you jump out of a plane and after you go to confession like you can conquer the world. Yeah. And yet yeah. I remember once I was skydiving with my son Jeremiah, and he was his first jump, and there was someone else in the plane that was attached to their jump master, and uh, we had to take a delay. Because uh, we were going to do a, we had to take the delay because so many people had gotten out of the plane and we'd gone out of the jump zone. By the time time we came back to the jump zone, that guy had lost his bowels, and oh. the whole and the whole plane stunk. So the question is, do you want to stay in your own blankety blank blank, and you you know, or do you want to jump out of the plane and get forgiven? So it takes courage to go to confession. We're talking with Joe McLean. He is the uh, the host of A Catholic Take, an author, a document documentary, and, pu and public speaker. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Schoolofmanliness.com is a place for men of grit and grace to join together, to inspire, to encourage, and to challenge each other to grow in manly virtue. Members receive morning man meditations, a monthly curriculum that is rich with audio, video, and written content, and a trail guide to help you map out your new trajectory. Many of our members lead their sons through this same curriculum. Your membership gives you access to both the Man Cave, which is our non-Facebook type community, and the School of Manliness at schoolofmanliness.com. Become a member at schoolofmanliness.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, Joe, what do you, when you say you give people the straight talk, what are the things you're telling? Like the last time you spoke to a theology on tap or to young, young mm -hmm. um, men and women, what did you say to them? You gotta make the radical choice. You know, I ask the, I usually ask this question when I give parish talks or, 
or men's conference talks or whatever, I ask, I usually ask the question, I do a little survey, raise your hand if you've ever actually prayed and asked God to make you an actual saint. How many people have gotten on their knees and actually prayed and asked God to make them a saint? And very, very few people have ever raised their hand. I mean, there's always a handful or whatever, but it's incredible how very few Catholics have ever actually prayed like St. Therese did to become an actual saint. And then, so I always like to compare and contrast the lives of saints. Uh, like today's the, you know, we're, uh, today's the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. He's not your patron saint of zookeepers or bird baths. Good grief. This is the guy who <laughs> quit the order, lived in a cave because his brother friars were a little bit too complacent, a little bit too comfortable for his liking. They mm. weren't as quite as hardcore as he would have preferred. So he lived in a cave, had the stigmata and died in ecstasy. I mean, that's not your bird bath kind of a priest. What made him or kind of a saint rather, what made him unique and interesting? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. Why would St. Therese of Little of Lisieux, the little flower, why would she ask God and her superior for permission to become a victim soul? Why would she do that? Why, why would she choose to suffer intentionally? Why would her mom, Zelly Martin, walk several miles uh, every day in the wintertime in snow to go nurse uh, her, her baby when she was wealthy enough, could have afforded a carriage, no problem. She was a businesswoman, owned a manufacturing business. Her husband worked for her, for crying out loud. But still, they lived below their means. Why did they get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and drag their kids to daily mass every day? These are the kinds of the questions that we should be asking ourselves. And when you look at the lives of saints and sinners, saints, uh, you know, like the ones I just mentioned, or, or like sinners, like Don Juan of Austria, who, when he found the Turkish fleet in October, October 6th of 1571, he said, now is the time to fight when his admirals were twice his age and twice his experience. Like, no, we should talk about this. Heck no, we, this is the time to fight. The time for counsel is over. And he yeah. drew his sword and they lined up in battle formation and Our Lady blew the fleet into yes. the harbor yeah. and the rest is as they say history. Right. Why, do, why do courageous men lead instead of follow? Mm -hmm. Why do saints choose to embrace the cross, die on Calvary because better to be zealous and hot and full of fire than it is to be lukewarm, safe, go alone to get along and never upset the apple cart. That is the question we should ask. And that's kind of what I do with teens or men or women. It's like, you just, you gotta talk very straight to them because most of the time we, they've been coddled, right? They, they, we, it's been easy for us. And um, maybe I'm a little different. I served in the Marine Corps, so I've gotten used to people screaming at me. So it just becomes the way to get attention in some ways. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to remember at the end of the day, we have got to meet people where they're at, but our job is to get them where they gotta go, right? We can't just meet them where they're at and hang out with them. Jesus never even did that. He always met them where they're at and then helped them get where they have to go. So that is ultimately our mission. And Beautiful. we've got to cut through the noise to get them to just listen. Beautiful. You know, the thing about uh, a man like, like you, you described is that when you have a creed that you live by, you really know this is who, this is the way I'm wired and this is the way God's made me and this is who I am and this is the creed I will live by. And then you have a code that you follow, which is, you know, like you think about the, the code of, you said you're a, you, you were a Marine, you know, Semper Fi, and then, and then there's the Marine code that you live by. It doesn't take long to make decisions. You know, you, you know the right response. You know the true good. You don't have to be clever or conniving. You know it. And then you take action. When I, when I hear people, uh, it's not uncommon now for people to say, oh, the government this or the, or the COVID that or or you know the 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 uh, the woke culture this complain 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 but I, they sound like victims they're not meant they don't take action so you to identify that there's a problem be aware of it is one thing but to do something about it is, is totally something else and yeah. you know when men say when men say you know oh man they make fun of us as men nowadays they've relegated us you know to be provincial buffoons you know uh, that sounds like very weak victims not mm -hmm. men who'll say, "I don't care what hand I've been dealt. I'm going to fight. I'm going to, I'm going to live a life of grit and grace." Yeah. So, so what do you tell the men when you speak with them? They have to make that choice to be to be uh, the man on the porch, or as you say, 
the cowboy, right? Like it's the same sort of a uh, metaphor, right? We have to be the guy on the porch, our, our calling as men, as priests, prophets, and kings, leaders, protectors, and providers is to be the wall through which the enemy must go if it's going to get to those women and children, those sons and daughters whom are under our care and protection. So you gotta get through me first. And if I'm living a sinful lifestyle, well, then there's a giant hole, a breach through the wall Absolutely. with which the enemy is going to come in and decimate those innocents that we are charged with protecting, providing for, and the rest. So we have to live first in a state of grace and pursue the, uh, the holy virtues. So again, I share my own fault, uh, faults, my own failings. I give them my own story of a life of, uh, of uh, pornography addiction and mortal sins and how my wife tried to divorce me and how how I had a mystical experience with Jesus that literally changed everything for me and put me on a wild ride. And I've been on that ride ever since. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean your experience that you had an experience with Jesus? You had an encounter. I got married. I became Catholic just to get married. I was a hedonistic uh, man addicted to pornography. And when my, my when my wife said, when I asked her to marry me, that that I had to become Catholic, I was like, well, I hadn't thought about that before. That's interesting. I hadn't considered that. But I'm like, what do I care, really? I, yeah, I mean, just just go punch the ticket. Get get yeah. The, yeah. So I was a Freemason, actually, a third degree master Mason at the time. So I thought it was kind of hilarious, to be honest. And I didn't take it at all seriously, even though the, the RCIA team was very kind, very charitable to me, very tolerant of my shenanigans and my behavior. So I couldn't fault them. They didn't teach me theology of any kind. I can trust me on that one. But, but they were very, very good about meeting me where I was at. So I checked that box, got married. Um, and then once we were married, I didn't need to go to church anymore. What's the point? I, I checked the box. So uh, my life really was going back to the way it was as soon as we were married. And uh, two years into our marriage, I had lost my job. So I was addicted to pornography. I had broken my, my wife's heart on countless occasions. I was the most incredibly rude person when it came to the way I treated her family. And then I didn't have a job, didn't bring home a paycheck. So what good was I actually? I didn't love, honor, and respect her. And I also didn't care for her needs anymore. So she was pretty much done with me. She actually wrote it on a piece of paper. She divided up all of her, our, her small little assets. You take this, I take that, and I'm done. And it was interesting because it was the first weekend of April of 2002. It was blue skies and, and sunshine and low humidity. It was a gorgeous, beautiful day. But in that moment, you see, I had just spent 20 years pursuing my father who when my mom and my dad got divorced, both went off and remarried and divorced several other times. And I was chasing my father's affirmation. And I had stro striven for many years to become a man that I thought my father would be proud of, someone he would finally respect and appreciate. And what I'd realized on that first weekend of April in 2002, that I had become exactly like my father, a man who was addicted to pornography, a man who abused himself and others, a man who was broken, a man who is now looking at a broken marriage. And the realization of that, you know, the reality of this pursuit that I had been on for two decades hit me like a sledgehammer. And I, f I remember feeling very desperate and, um, and just really didn't know what to do. I did not want this to happen. All of a sudden, from one second to the next, I didn't, I, like I, before I wouldn't have cared, like I don't need her, I can always find someone else to, Oh my heavens, what have I done? And I remember I went and grabbed the Bible off the shelf that they had given me an RCIA class, the only other time it had ever been opened. And it was a St. Joseph's edition. It's a terrible translation. Don't ever buy yeah, it. Yeah, the, really, the, the very unique font that, font that they use, everything oh else. Oh my heavens. So anyway, so I, I grabbed this Bible out and I opened it to the very last place it had ever been opened, Matthew chapter five. And when that, when that passage was read to me in uh, in RCIA class, I had a mystical encounter that night too. When they when they read through the Beatitudes and they got to blessed are the pure in spirit for they shall see God, time stopped for me when I was in RCIA class. The moment ex like expanded for me and like everything stopped and paused, and this ultimate clear thought popped into my head: that is true, and you will not see God because you are not pure. Let's take you a break. Let, to porn. Let's take a break. You mentioned taking a, you had a, you had a big pause. 
<laughs> and we need to take a break. I think it's good. Well, this is kind of let, we'll come back right right back to this and go deeper into this. That moment when the Holy Spirit brings conviction, uh, not necessarily condemnation. We kind of bring that on ourselves. But that moment of conviction when He says, when the Lord points out a flaw and says, "You're better than this. I can help you with this. Are you ready to? Are you ready?" To, to move on. We're talking with Joe McLean, author, speaker, documentarian, radio host. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. My newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? has hit the top five in Christian books for a good reason. It's because men are searching for traction and a trail guide to live out the unique calling and the gifts that they were born with, that each man individually is factory loaded with by God. Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, do all things in love. Finally, here is a book that talks with men the way men talk with each other. Just plain old straight shoot. By the way, Mama Bears, this is your chance to get this message to your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com or anywhere books are sold. 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to remind everybody that the new book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, is out. And uh, and uh, it's something I think not just for men, it's for women, especially young women to read if they want to know really what kind of man they want to be looking for in their lives. It's something for, uh, for fathers to read to their sons, for men to read together. In fact, if you go to deepadventure.com and you join the Man Cave in our School of Manliness, we get together every two or three weeks uh, for our Man Cave Zoom meetups. We just had one a couple days ago. And we're actually right now uh, reading through that book. It's part of our, our three-year curriculum in the, in the School of Manliness. So we have with us today Joe McLean, who, uh, who, who's talking to us about that, piv- that pivotal moment. It's, a dis- it's decision time, and it can go one way or the other. So yeah. you had this moment when you were reading the Beatitude, and the one that says, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And the Holy Spirit said what to you? Yeah, so when I, 1999, 1998, when I was in RCIA, when I... When I first uh, was going through that passage, I had this moment of clarity, this mystical moment where this idea popped in my head that this is true. Like, it's it's true. Not like, well, this could be, sounds true, sounds good. No, this is absolute truth. You are not pure. You're addicted to porn. You've committed all kinds of mortal sins, including abortion. And you are not pure. You're not going to see God. You die right now, you go to hell. That 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 reality hit me like a ton of bricks. And I even said to myself, it's a good thing I'm going to live a long life. Maybe someday in the future I will be free to pursue this, but I know I'm not free now. I'm a slave. And that was that night. Now, fast forward back to 2002. My wife had asked to divorce me, and I had this moment. So I go pull this Bible out, and I pull it out and open it up to the very last place, Matthew chapter 5. And I start reading those Beatitudes because I didn't really I didn't know what to do. This is like, I, I don't know. This is I'm supposed to do this. So I pull this out. I start reading it. And by the time I get to... Blessed are the pure in spirit. I find myself down on my knees, for you shall not not see God. And then all of a sudden, coming out of my mouth without thinking about it first, I say the words, I cannot do this, Lord. Only you can do this. And in that moment of time, the God of the universe came to visit me. Now, it was an interior locution. I didn't see him. I his felt his presence was overwhelming to me. And in that moment, he gave me three things. But three things no, wait, on wait, my wait, heart. Wait, 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 before you say that. Describe that overwhelming feeling. How how would you best describe that? 
the goose pimples on my hand, the hair that stands up on the back of your neck, the overwhelming feeling of the presence in the room, your heart feeling like it's going to burst and then it's on fire. With, I mean, just this, this, and you can't see with your eyes. It's I mean, my, there, was, for, there it's, wasn't a physical person in the room that I could physically see. It was all spiritually felt. And then the interior locution of hearing, hearing the, uh, the voice of our Lord speak to me and basically putting, giving me three things, three things. The first thing he said was that I was going to pursue purity, that I must be pure. I didn't even know what that meant, Bear. I grow, I, as a little boy, I inherited pornography from my dad. I mean, my, some of my earliest memories are of pornography. So oh. I've only ever known porn as love, which is, you know, the inverse of that, actually. Right. So I didn't have a clue what purity actually meant, but it was clear to me I was going to pursue it one way or the other. The next thing he put on my heart was you broke your marriage. It's time for you to fix your marriage. He allowed me to see that there was going to be a passion that I was to take up my cross and I was to go to Calvary. And there I was to die next to him on the cross for my marriage. He allowed me to see what was going to happen, that, the, that there was going to be an incredible struggle over my marriage and that there was going to be a lot of problems. But I was expected, he was requiring me to suffer through all of it, the humiliations, the, uh, the losses and everything else. I was expected to suffer in order to save my marriage. He made that so clear to me. In fact, I, I can tell so you wait stories a minute. What, wait, no, how wait bad a minute. that was. No, wait a minute. I don't, I don't get this. So the Lord comes into your heart, and he doesn't say, presto, change, oh, I've fixed everything? No, it gets better. So he, he's expecting me to chase purity, whatever that meant. I didn't even know it yet. And then he was expecting me to suffer to fix my marriage. And he actually showed me how I would be suffering in order to fix my marriage, to win back my wife's heart because I had shattered it into a billion pieces. Mm -hmm. And the third thing he puts on my heart is an insatiable hunger and a desire to get to know him. You know, it's fascinating because, you know, God does a miracle in your life. He and th so many times he has done amazing things for so many different people all the time. I mean, the stories are just so numerous. Of course he does. He's a personal God and he loves us each individual. Exactly. Yeah. And yet it blew me away in spite of the fact that I was raised Church of Christ, had been to Sunday school, and in spite of the fact that I had gone through RCIA class, not all that long. Uh, you know, er, much uh, further from uh, from this very moment that I'm describing now, and I felt like I didn't have a clue who he was. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, like I just, I, I'm like, who are you? And so this this insane desire to get to know him just possessed me. Well, I mean, well, it literally how, possessed me. How it did changed you, everything. How, how did you? How did you? Then. Uh, God does do that. He gives us an insatiable desire for more and more and more of him. He does that. He's filling us, filling us, filling us, and yet we want more and more and more. Uh, so so um, did, you, did, did, you, did you pursue that in prayer? Did you pursue that uh. in, in reading uh, uh, the Greek fathers? Or, I mean, well, how, how, how did, how? Yes, answers. All of it, actually, yes, to be honest with you. But the first thing I did before I did any of that was I picked up the phone, and I was in this like, sort of euphoric moment. And uh, I called my wife and I explained to her what happened. And then I told her that this coming Sunday, I was going to go to church and I would like her to come with me. And my wife is Portuguese from Massachusetts and she can curse as good as any sailor that I've ever met or Marine that I've ever served with. And she cursed me out like you wouldn't believe it. But I got to tell you, in spite of that, just letting her get it out, she still went to mass with me on that Sunday. Well, let me Please ask you a question. God. Who was praying for you during that time? So almost no one. I, I mean, there was, of course, some people, I'm sure, like my sponsors uh, from uh, going through the RCIA program coming into the church, whom I didn't really talk to at that bunch. I'm sure they were praying for us. But nonetheless, um, the wild ride really began. One of the first things I did was I started to read my Bible. Page one, paragraph one. And then I was reading it, you know, all the way cover to cover. And I needed to hear the word of God preached and explained. So I turned to the radio. And when I turned the radio on where I lived up in New England, there was no Catholic radio station. There was only Protestant radio station. So I started listening to Protestant radio 
all the time, as often as I could possibly get my hands on it. And I got to be honest with you, all I ever heard them preach on was almost always anti-Catholic. I mean, almost with no exception. There was almost, there was a hint of, of something about the Catholic Church in almost every sermon, and they would go on and on and on and on. And then, of course, I had my neighbor who was a fallen away Catholic turned Baptist, and, and he's like, you got to get out of that Catholic Church. You know, it's the whore of Babylon. So while I'm struggling to suffer for my marriage, trying to understand and get to know who Jesus really is, I'm being led back down this Protestant route, which I grew up the Protestant church, so it kind of made sense to me. And uh, there was two things that happened. Two people came into my life almost at the same time that really altered the course uh, and the reason why I can be here today. The first person was a man by the name of Alistair Begg, a Calvinist anti-Catholic Scotsman who is a famous televangelist. And he got on the radio and he was really giving the, the Catholic Church a, a hammer blow. And uh, he said something that really resonated with me. He said it was Constantine who corrupted the church, brought in all this Catholic stuff. And I'm like, oh, ding, 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 light bulb goes off. Listen, I'm no genius. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn once, and all I got to do is figure out what the church looked like, sounded like, acted like before Constantine was ever born, and that would be the true uh -oh, church with uh -oh. which I you, could go uh -oh. find. That's a slippery thinking. slope, dude. When you start going that, I, I you know, it's like it's like when you when you deal with 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 um, uh, the, the Protestant movement. Um, it's almost as if I had a beautiful friend here, a Southern Baptist friend here the, uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, and just beautiful Christian, loves Jesus, but no angst towards the church. But it's almost as if there was Jesus, and then the Bible fell out of the sky, and then there, right. was, then there was 500 right. years ago, and now right. we're back on track. But when yeah. you start going the path of finding out what the primitive church was like... Yeah, it's over. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk <laughs> more over. about that when you come back. I love that subject. I have the... have I'm surrounded... You know, behind me, you can probably see all the writings of the early church fathers... These were saints. I mean, not everything they say is exactly right, but you can see where their where their heart is. You know, we, you you know. Um, but the uh, and then in front of me, I have a, a, a two volume set called the Primitive Church that my wife bought me for my birthday about eight about seven or eight years ago. But just uh, when you start exploring the Primitive Church, it's like the emperor isn't wearing any. Finally, realizes he's not wearing any clothes. It's like you're on done because you go, oh, the Primitive Church believed and uh, worshipped and their moral teaching and their doctrine is the doctrine of the Catholic Church today. We're talking with our yeah. guest, Joe McLean. We're going to get deeper into that. Um, Joe is an author, a speaker, has his radio show, A Catholic, a Catholic Take, a uh, film documentarian, a man of God, an evangelist. Uh, have him come speak to you. Oh, Joe, I forget to ask, to ask you, where can people find you? Livinghislife.net. Wow. That's a that's that's pretty powerful. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. My newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, has hit the top five in Christian books for a good reason. It's because men are searching for traction and a trail guide to live out the unique calling and the gifts that they were born with, that each man individually is factory loaded with by God. 
Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, do all things in love. Finally, here is a book that talks with men the way men talk with each other. Just plain old straight shoot. By the way, Mama Bears, this is your chance to get this message to your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com or anywhere books are sold. 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. People ask me, why do you call it the Bear Wozniak Adventure? Well, because each of us are on an adventure. God has a plan. Uh, one of the things that happened when Joe gave his life to the Lord is God gave him a plan. From the very moment he felt the infusion of the Holy Spirit and God's love fill his heart, God said, I'm, he gave him three things that he was going to do, three plans. God says, if you, I know what I have in store for you. Some of you right now are very, that you're hearing this and you realize that you've painted yourself into a corner, but it doesn't seem like there's anywhere out. But God has a plan for you. You know, there's an image of a man petting a cat and the cat is very loving towards this cat petting the cat across the back and the cat is arching and bristling and, sss and hates it it's because he's petting it against the grain of the fur and the man's just saying very lovingly to the cat turn around cat turn around cat and then you feel the Lord all this this uh, correction God's bringing into your life it begins to feel you begin to sense and understand God's love but God gave Joe three things right from the very moment he, he experienced had the personal encounter uh, a plan for him. God has a plan for you. So no matter how deep you're in it, no matter how, how uh, much of a hole you think you're in, uh, this, is, this is why God's in the Savior biz, right? He's, he's not just Lord, he's your Savior. So just say, Lord, I give you all that I am. And then, you know, one of the things that God gave to Joe was a great desire to get to know God. And the Bible just says, if you seek me, I know what I have in store for you, plans for peace not destruction, a future reserved for you, full of hope, not too late. He has a future for you. If you seek me, I will let you find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. There's a teacher, and I'm not sure because there's two or three that have taught about this, but um, he basically says that God hides himself just enough so the man who doesn't want to find him won't see him, but the man who does want to find him will. That We have such a man as that with us today, Joe, Joe McLean. So we're, we're getting into uh, some, some of the grit and grace of, this, of your, your walk with the Lord. So you, you made the mistake of saying, hmm, yeah, I wonder what the early church, if I find out how the early church worshiped, taught, then I would know how, what, 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 how to walk with the Lord. So tell us about yeah. that moment <laughs> or that, so, that beginning, that journey. That was huge. I, I'd made the decision that I was going to uh, read anything of the Christian community outside of sacred scripture and before Constantine was even born. So that was my time zone. Anything within that period, and I tried to read everything, and it was good, it was bad. I mean, like, even the bad stuff, even like, you know, uh, uh, the Gospel of, uh, of, uh, of what's his name? The, the Mary Magdalene or Thomas. Yeah, the, the, or, what, we, what we, would, we would not the, consider part of the early church fathers. Exactly, right, even the, the Gnostic the Gnostics, stuff. The Gnostics, yeah, yeah. And it was so, even like, I'm a scholar, I'm a knuckle dragger, and it was obvious just how different that was from, say, you know, the epistles of, uh, you know, Shepherd of Hermes or the Didache, Justin the Martyr, Ignatius of Antioch. You start reading yeah, all those, of those things. Totally, a, 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 totally in alignment with each other. Yeah, totally in yeah. alignment with the teaching that there is one one Catholic Church, one yeah. universal Catholic Church, and you know what, Joe? It was, Joe, it was Justin Martyr. Yeah, that got to me. I, I was reading the early Church Fathers. Sure, and it was when I read the Epiclesis. I believe that's what it's called. When he said, when it said, um, you know, when the when the host is is sanctified and become and is transubstantiated mm -hmm. into the body, blood, soul, and divinity, those words there. I go, wait a minute. I learned that as an altar boy. Right, and this yeah, was right. written. This was written a hundred, about a hundred fifty. Yeah, yeah. one fifty A.D. And you know, Justin Martyr wrote those words, and died for writing them. And you know why yeah. he wrote them too? He wrote them. He was writing to the emperor, and he said, mm -hmm. "I know people say that we're uh, th think that we're cannibals, that we're right. eating a man called me eating a man." Well, yes and no. 
you know. That, but, <laughs> that, right, but, that, yeah. but that's how literally and yeah. seriously the early, the primitive church considered the yeah. Eucharist. So yeah. okay, so so all of a for sudden, me, for me, it was Ignatius of Antioch. Yes, uh, you know, I absolutely fell in love with Ignatius of Antioch. The Didache too was very well, but profound. Tell, tell people who who Ignatius was. It, you know, Iggy, Iggy and I go way back. <laughs> I, Ignatius, Ignatius was a uh, he was a guy who learned. He was a disciple of the Apostle John who stood at the foot of the cross and watched our Savior die for our sins. That's how close he was to to the source. And in some scholars believe when our Lord takes the infant into his arms and says, unless you're like the ch a child like this, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Some scholars believe that child was Ignatius of Antioch. Just let that sink in too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is a guy who was a bishop and he was so well known, so well respected that uh, he he basically was an early church rock star like he, he was he was uh fulton sheen before there was ever well, a fulton antioch, sheen. antioch was one of the five major centers of, of right. christianity as it was spreading so for yeah. him to be that bishop saint peter ruled from antioch for seven years so uh he is he is inheriting the throne the cathedra of saint peter himself within mm. antioch within the diocese of antioch well and that must so have been a he, cool ride so no problems in his life Right, <laughs> that's right. So in, in about the year 107, depends on which scholar you look at, 110, 107, somewhere in this vicinity, you know, Trajan was coming to town. He was just getting ready for a war with Persia and he was using Antioch. He was using, he was using that part of his empire as a staging ground. And while he was in town, he demanded everybody to be on the same page. So it's time to pinch the incense and show your loyalty. You're not just well, loyalty, worship of the emperor. Exactly. Because he's a demigod. They were gonna offer incense yeah. to, to him as a god. Now they had just gone through a persecution already before this point. So he had already had martyrs within his flock and he wasn't sure if they were gonna be able to take another one. And the reason why this persecution was gonna be harder than the first one was because now he also had a sect of uh, the docetists in his diocese. These were Catholics who looked the part. They had smells and bells and vestments, they had liturgies, they talked the talk, but they weren't actual Catholics. They had no problem separating what the body does, which is evil, sexual sins in particular, or offering incense to Caesar, versus what the soul does. The soul is good, it's gonna go to heaven, it's no problem. The body is bad, so it's always gonna do bad stuff. So he had this problem because he knew that there would be a lot of uh, people in his flock who, when they had to choose dying as a martyr or becoming a docetist and still having liturgies and smells and bells and all the rest, and getting to live for another day. He knew that would be very tempting. So uh, some say he turned himself in, others say he was hunted down and arrested, but either way, we have an ancient account of his interaction. And at that time, with, wasn't, he year, wasn't he almost 100 years old? Well, he was old. He wasn't a young guy, for sure. I don't know how old he was. I don't think I've ever seen anything on his age but we, at the time. But we, but, but we gotta take this now. Bring this to the point of what of what it meant to you, because you got, we gotta, I wanna make sure we get to the this conversion sure. moment. Yeah. So a bo bottom line is when you read Ignatius of Antioch, there's, it's, you can't deny it. You and I could sit here all day and talk about him, that's for day. sure. Yeah. And he uses the word Catholic in his letter to the Samaritans. So that's how important of a figure he is. 107, 110 AD, he was eaten by lions in the Circus Maximus in Rome in that year. And so I could speak forever on that guy, he's so powerful. But when I got through Tertullian, when I read Tertullian's The Flesh of Christ, it was like, I'm done. This is over. This is this is so over. The argument is over. The early church is 100% Catholic. At the same time that was going on in my life, there was a lady at our parish who recognized we were on a, this wild ride. She saw something was happening. She wasn't sure. And somehow she got invited to our house one day. And she comes over and she's sitting down with us, trying to figure us out. What's going on with you two? I sense something real here. And uh, she hands me a tape set, a set of cassette tapes. Now, yeah, listen, I, I'm old. You don't there. have a cassette player. I don't know how old player. you are, but you know, they yeah. used to have cassette tapes back in the day. There I was a big a cassette tape. There was a cassette tape ministry. It was a huge part of uh, evangelization. That's tr yeah, that's right. That was back in the day. Well, the t cassette tape set that she handed me was from this obscure guy called Scott Hahn, and it was called <laughs> calling. It was called calling all Bible Christians to be Catholic and vice versa. And when I listened to this oh, tape cool. set, yeah. when I listened to this, it was my very first exposure ever to Catholic apologetics. 
I had been listening to Protestants war against the Catholic Church. Against, Where is this against, in the Bible? against false straw man exactly. arguments, too, for the most part. Exactly. Hey, you got one minute, dude. Take us so, home. So what I never actually did the entire time I listened to those Protestants was I never stopped to ask what the Catholic Church had to say in response. Ever, ever. So it was the early church fathers. It was Scott Hahn and Tim Staples and Patrick Madrid and, and all of these uh, incredible Catholic evangelists and authors who convinced me that the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, and I needed to give my heart to it. And that's exactly what I did. And when I did that, so many things took off in my life, and we've been on that wild ride it, ever it, since. I, and I, I would say, wild ride, it, to me, it seems like you came into a safe harbor. The, yeah, the, for the, sure. as, far, as far as the rockiness, you know, uh, when you're on a sailboat and you're spending the night and, you, and you're in the wrong harbor, you don't sleep. So you had this <laughs> restlessness, you know, and uh, because of the waves are rocking or whatever, you find it a good, that, that's what it is. It's, it, you brought yourselves home to this beautiful, the, the arms, uh, uh, in, in Hawaii, a woman is, is, is described as a big harbor, a big bay with mm. big open arms. That's what the church is. She brought you home, and then she said, and then it was like, uh, it was like, um, uh, you got a minute? Uh, Joe, we got some work for you to do, <laughs> and then yeah. and then you begin, yeah. and then the ministry came, and you weren't you weren't the smartest man in the world, or the, even the holiest at that time, uh, but God, I'm used, still not. But 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 it's like an on the job training, right? God uses you and yeah, right. propels yeah. you along. So for those that are listening, no matter where you are, it's a come as you are party. Just come to the Lord and say, Lord, I love you. Forgive me. Receive, receive me. Uh, receive the the sacrament of reconciliation. Go to go to communion. And then say, okay, Lord, now let's start. And God, God will make his way known to you. God, he'll make your path straight. Joe McClain, thanks for being with us on our show. How can they find Thank you? Thank you for having me. What's that? How can they find you if they want to bug you and have you come speak or... Bear, thank you for having me on. I really do appreciate you. The website is livinghislife.net. Livinghislife.net. I love looking at your room. You guys, you got to watch the YouTube version of this show. I, lo I love all those books around you. The last three people that I've interviewed, just surrounded by books. Do you like the smell of books? Yes, I like the feel of books, too. Yeah, me too, me too. Every author does. Okay, so until uh, next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Thanks for listening to the Bear Wildstick Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wildstick Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.